Today, a summary of the findings of the Mona Lisa II clinical trial. <clears throat> Just to give you a little background as to why this is important, about two-thirds of breast cancers happen to be what we call hormone dependent. We think that they develop on the basis of abnormal hormonal exposure. For these patients, hormonal or endocrine treatments represent the treatment of choice both in the primary and in the metastatic setting. So after several months of uh, hormonal or what is rather anti-hormonal treatment, breast cancer becomes resistant to endocrine therapy, and there has been a rich uh, area of research in breast cancer trying to develop strategies to overcome or prevent or reverse resistance to endocrine or hormonal therapy. And one of the most uh, promising lines of research uh, in this direction has been the development of uh, cycling uh, dependent kinase inhibitors, and I'll explain that a little bit more. On this cartoon, I show you how the cell prepares. It doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Yeah. All right. On this cartoon, the, I show you how the cell prepares for dividing and for proliferating. So there are a number of external factors uh, shown on the top left part, uh, some of them growth factors, some of them uh, a variety of other uh, uh, proteins that influence a, a signaling pathway that uh, uh, focuses on cyclin D and the cyclin-dependent uh, kinases, in this case described as CDK4 and 6. Now this complex governs the, um, the uh, uh, release of a factor called E2F that you see on the lower right side and separates it from the retinoblastoma protein or RB. And once that happens, then gene transcription starts. The cell goes from the uh, um, G1 or G0 part of the cell cycle into S1, which is the synthesis of DNA, and then proliferation and cell division continues. So many investigators in our group have felt that blocking this process of releasing the E2F factor would be an important um, a way to interfere with this process. Now, this is important because phosphorylation of RB by CDK4-6 uh, is what precipitates the cell cycle progression, and uh, increased cell cycle or CDK4-6 activity driven by perturbations of other aspects of cell life is associated with endocrine, endocrine therapy resistance, and that's, there's a very rich area of literature about that. Now, ribocyclib is one small molecule uh, that is orally available, and it is a selective inhibitor of cyclin-dependent kinase 4-6. Now, this line of research has been going on for over 15, 20 years, but only recently have the selective for, uh, CDK4-6 inhibitors become available. <coughs> Now, this is the design of the Mona Lisa II uh, study. Uh, so, um, it uh, recruited patients who were postmenopausal and had hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, advanced breast cancer or metastatic breast cancer, who had received no prior therapy for advanced disease. They were randomly assigned uh, to either uh, letrozole, which is a commonly used endocrine therapy, plus placebo, or letrozole plus ribocyclib, the CDK4-6 inhibitor. And uh, the primary endpoint of the study was progression-free survival, um, as well as a number of secondary endpoints such as survival, response rate, clinical benefit rate, etc. Uh, the study was supposed to uh, recruit uh, 668 patients, which it did. They were evenly distributed in the two arms, and the analysis, the first analysis was planned when about 70% of 302 
progression-free survival events had been reached. Um, so I mentioned the enrollment criteria. Uh, patients who had received prior systemic therapy for the advanced disease or those who had inflammatory breast cancer or a history of cardiac disease were not uh, uh, eligible for participation. So this is the main um, result of the trial at the interim analysis. So uh, when only 70% of the expected events had occurred, there was such a significant difference between the two curves in terms of progression survival that uh, it was declared that statistically the study had met its primary endpoint. And as shown on this uh, slide, there was a, a hazard ratio of 0.556, or about a 44% reduction in progression-free events, with a median follow-up of 15.3 months. And as you can tell from these curves, they start to separate very early, and the separation continues and expands. The median progression-free survival for the control group was 14.7 months, which is actually better than what we have seen historically with endocrine therapy alone. In the um, investigational arm with ribocyclib, the median has not been reached. The data will need to be followed uh, until further maturity, but it is expected that it will far exceed what the uh, control arm did. Adverse events uh, were uh, commonly seen, but were mostly uh, uncomplicated and asymptomatic hematologic uh, uh, changes, especially myelosuppression, neutropenia, leukopenia, anemia, and thrombocytopenia. To a much lesser event, uh, to a much lesser extent, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, alopecia, rash, and in a small number of patients, elevations on liver function tests were also reported. Most of these were a grade one and two. Grade three and four was uncommon, and very few patients discontinued treatment on the basis of adverse events. The side effects or uh, asymptomatic toxicities were managed with dose interruptions and dose uh, reductions but the great majority of patients were able to continue and complete therapy. So on the basis of these results, we concluded that patients who received ribocyclib with letrozole had a statistically significant and a clinically meaningful increase in progression-free survival compared to letrozole plus placebo or letrozole alone again with the hazard ratio and a very powerful p-value included in parentheses. The treatment benefit, uh, and I did not show you this, but we did a number of uh, pre-planned subset analysis, and the treatment benefit was present in all subsets, regardless of age, performance status, extent or location of metastasis, um, and um, other secondary endpoints such as response rate, and clinical benefit rate also favored the combination. Ribocyclic was well tolerated, and the side effects and toxicities that I described were well managed by dose interruptions and reductions. And it is uh, our conclusion that this combination represents an important advance for patients with metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer. I might mention that two other clinical trials with this same agent uh, have completed accrual in different subsets of patients with hormone-dependent breast cancer, and we are expecting the data to mature to round out the, um, the role of this combination in the management of advanced breast cancer. Thank you very much. <laughs>